Oh, greetings, brethren, and welcome again to Shepherd's Voice magazine. We want to thank you for telling your friends and enemies, and we, as always, we thank you for your feedback, and we want to encourage you to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. So let's jump off today by turning to Hebrews 4. We'll get you to put your finger there for a moment. We'll get right to it. Um, I'm always interested in relating Jesus' physical life on this earth to our own and trying to put the scriptural pieces together. And what we'll try to do today maybe is to gain a clear depiction uh, in our heads uh, as to how it is that Jesus was both tempted yet came through it all without sinning. And we'll ask the question, I mean, really, how was he tempted? What, what tempted Jesus Christ? What was he tempted to do? You know, we have all kinds of superficial temptations around us that can knock us off of uh, our course, and even some that can damage our faith. Uh, we, we even have temptations and stumbling areas in, in our lives that concern our will versus the ultimate will of God. And these are the ones that really, really need our attention. And this is a bit of what we'll talk about today. Um, these are the things that make it necessary for us to have a high priest and one who advocates on our behalf. So as I said, Hebrews 4, uh, and uh, as we'll read further today in Hebrews 5 and in other scriptures, they, they speak of Jesus Christ as the high priest. So, without any further ado, let's uh, turn over there and let's look at Hebrews 4 and verse 15, where we read, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. And this is a powerful de description of the life of Jesus Christ while he was living as a human. And we always have to keep this in mind. When, when Jesus was here, he, he was here as a human, in the flesh. And he was learning what it meant to be human. And to qualify, not just as a high priest, but the high priest. And in fact, our high priest. And as we said, not only that, he did it without sinning. How did he manage that? How did he manage that? Well... As we'll read today, the implications were immense for Jesus Christ. And these are some of the things that we will take note of today, uh, along with how multifaceted Jesus Christ's life is and why we need to be really careful never to place any kind of uh, limitation on him. So, God willing, we'll discover that we have an, ever, an even greater bond with him okay uh, through how he got through being human you see unfortunately some are going to teach that jesus came knowing everything from jump street straight out of the gate that wouldn't make for a tremendous amount of relatability if you ask me um so what this means is that there was in fact training that went into jesus christ becoming the high priest okay and let's have a look at a little bit of that right now and we'll look at the uh, uh the training of jesus christ as a high high priest and we'll note that god the father actually put certain circumstances and situations before jesus so that he would experience them and this again was part of that training that we're talking about and some of those instances are reported for us. So uh, we'll note again uh, that the writer of Hebrews here uh, thought to tell us that throughout Christ's life, throughout his life, he made cries to God and supplications to God. And we'll look into a little bit of what that means. And these weren't all recorded for us. However, what we do need to pay attention to are the ones that indeed were. And we're going to do just that, hopefully, today. So, let's move over to Hebrews chapter 5. And we'll dive into some of the verses between 7 and 
10. That's uh, Hebrews 5, and we'll begin in verse 7. And we read, During his earthly life, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was the son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And after he was perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And he was declared by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. There's a lot going on in that passage. I, I often say that about these passages. There's a lot going on there. There's a lot of moving parts here. And we're going to have to break down some of it as we go along here. Um, but understanding that the word translated as supplications here, uh, if you're reading from the Christian Standard Bible, it says appeals in, here in Hebrews 5.7. This is not a common word to be found in the New Testament. And it, in fact, describes an appeal. Okay, an appeal, uh, entreaties, uh, or an earnest request, or an approach for favor. Okay, uh, so we have to think, why would Jesus Christ need to take that type of an approach? It's a valid question. Why would he need to take that uh, sort of an approach? Especially if he knew everything from Jump Street and was, you know, basically to be unaffected by his, his human walk. Uh, that's obviously, as we'll see, you're not the case. So we need to consider uh, this in the context that is given, you know, the, the, the whole picture. As I said the last week when I spoke, stand back and get the 37,000 foot view. Um, because what we see here is that Jesus himself asked God to take action over. Uh, instances in his life and it would be action that was actually above and beyond uh, what God's obligations actually were and verses 7 and 8 confirm that even Jesus God's only begotten son suffered and did so with these loud cries and vehement cries and tears uh, uh, he was really pouring himself out before God this really meant something to him and, and it does say that he, was, that he was heard. But it wasn't because of his status of being the son of God. Rather, it was because of his godly fear. It was for this fear that he had and reverence that he had for his father and his will. And Jesus himself was motivated uh, to go to his father with questions and with these supplications and was in need of an answer. And I would say that this is where we can kind of begin to see where there are parallels between Jesus' life and ours, is we're uh, it, kind of in the same situation a lot of the time, if not most of it. And, <clears throat> pardon me, although he was confident in his father's protection, um, he had that. Uh, he came to have a keen understanding, though, of what human life is and what it can be and in this way he's able to advocate on our behalf and Hebrews 4 is correct in saying that he's been tempted in all ways yet without sin without sinning um, certainly to appeal to the father in this manner means that he shares a lot with us in that he knows what it's like to be pulled in different directions uh, as it is for us sometimes with all of life's turns that can happen and some of them that are you know less less than pleasant um, it, it can be sometimes bewildering and certainly this is something that that Jesus was was experiencing so we see then that the life of Jesus again as we said was multifaceted and we cannot impose limitations on him and that includes uh, our perspective of Jesus Christ in terms of what his perspective of humanity is and what it means to be one of us. Okay? And uh, this, is, this is so important, brethren, because we need to uh, try to understand things that cultivate an even deeper relationship, a meaningful, tangible relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, and he knew what he was talking about. He knew what he was talking about, especially in places like Matthew 6.34 when he when he said, uh, uh, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. 
Okay, it was because he had lived it. He had been there. He knew what he was talking about. See, when we're unsure of what to do or become frustrated in our walk, it can lead to us potentially stumbling. And we've had a number of messages here of w what it actually means to stumble. You know, we, we don't want to stumble without getting back up again. You know, stumbling to a fall is not a place that we, that we want to be. Um, and that potential stumbling happens when we begin to doubt the Father's will in our lives. And this is where we r truly need to be spiritually keyed in and uh, try to gain as much context to the scriptures that we're reading as we possibly can. Because we won't always understand necessarily why or how our will or even perhaps what we perceive as our needs, um, why they or how they come into conflict somehow with the will of the Father. But inevitably, this is something that we will run across in our lives. And when we fail to properly recognize this conflict for what it is, uh, there will be a temptation. And we have a proclivity towards deviating from God's will. And that might lead us to ask, if Jesus Christ always stayed within the full knowledge of doing his Father's will, once these things began to uh, accumulate in his experience and his earthly walk, uh, how does he then qualify as the high priest to all of us who fall short? We fall short of this knowledge all the time. And sometimes it's that we ignore it, sometimes we just don't have it. And how about, you know, pretty much all of us who are still learning, who maybe have recognized something, but we're still learning and understanding who God is. There has to be something there for us, right? We would, we would certainly hope. Well, that's what the scriptures give us. They give us some hope in that regard. See, the writer of Hebrews gives us a start in understanding the answer. You see in uh, Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, uh, it says, He learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Okay? The things which he suffered. And having been perfected, so he became perfected once that suffering had taken place. This is after. Uh, he became the author of salvation to all who obey him. So, let's again, let's strive for some context here. By learning obedience... It's not suggesting that Jesus was in any way disobedient. We can get that out of our heads. That's not what this is saying. We can rule it out. It is, however, telling us that Jesus learned what it meant to be obedient as a human. And there's a distinction to be made there. And therefore, he understands the suffering that comes along with that, being human. And... Certainly, we've all suffered in our human state. I know we've all suffered the limitations of being human. You know, where, and where that sometimes can lead us in our hearts and in our minds. We can become very dark very quickly, and we need the light of Jesus Christ to, to guide us through these things. You see, Christ learned temptation by learning the temptation to be disobedient. If he was tempted in all ways as we are, then he was definitely tempted to be disobedient, yet he remained without sin, as we read there in Hebrews 4. In this kind of suffering and its related temptation to be disobedient um, was the kind of thing that brought him to up, offer up these prayers and supplications, and these appeals to God to intervene on his behalf. And the next part is really interesting in that statement because when he says that he offered up these prayers and supplications, in, in verse 7 it says, to him who was able to save him from death. Now, it's easy to think, and many have taught, that this means he was making appeals to the Father who could save him from the crucifixion, from his sacrifice, from the cross. We're not going to take a, a huge wander off into the cornfield about that today, brethren. But that is not what this is talking about. 
That is not what this is talking about. You see, if Jesus had sinned, if Jesus had disobeyed, believe me, everything goes sideways for everybody. Uh, and that's just to put it lightly. Okay? Um, believe me, we won't get into a big discussion about that in itself, but had Jesus sinned, then we're having an entirely different conversation. Uh, and we probably aren't having any conversation at all, to be honest with you. So the death that he's speaking of here is not that one. I'm certain, you know, he did say that God could save him from, uh, from that, that legions of angels could come, that sort of thing. But that's not what he's talking about. The only death that's in mind here is an eternal one, a permanent one. And that's what I mean by there would probably be no conversation because everything would go... Uh, sideways. It would be a complete disaster for mankind, brethren. The only death that he was fearing and that he was appealing to his father about was an eternal death. And we have to just think of how much this would have been on Jesus Christ's mind and the weight that he must have felt and carried. With that in mind, and especially as the realities in life mounted up as they will. And we're going to see one of those realities that came, became very, very vivid for Jesus Christ here in just a moment. But he depended on his father in an extraordinary way. And it was because of the possible results. He was aware of the limitations that were built in to being human. So this has something to do with fear. Notably, Jesus Christ's fear. And if we want to move a little further on down the line, we see it relating to our fear. See, in Hebrews 5, 7, we read that Jesus was heard because of his godly fear or reverence and that it had nothing to do with status. Well, do we possibly have to look at godly fear in our lives? Perhaps see if it's the same reverence that Jesus had? It's always good to look, brethren. Because the truth is, we exist in a world that, where we're between God and a wise and powerful adversary. You know, Satan's evil, but he's no dummy. And he knows where our weaknesses are. And thankfully, Jesus Christ knows that too and he makes that intercessory uh, intercessory uh, uh, intervention on our behalf and advocacy on our behalf because it's a precarious position we find ourselves in and we have to realize that we have a dependence on God for safety in the same way that Jesus Christ did we have that same dependence. And we can't take that relationship or whatever status that might lend to us for granted. That would be foolish to think that way. Uh, that is, our dependence on God knowing our proclivities to disobey. Okay, We need to be thankful that God is aware of these things and that Jesus Christ is there on our behalf. See, Jesus Christ clearly never took his lineage to God, and he had a direct relationship to God. He never used it as a means of advantage uh, when it came to being heard by his Father. And again, as we read, he was heard because of his reverence and godly fear. And this fear is an intense reverence. This is a most serious reverence that calls for attention. Unwavering attention and great caution on our part. This is something to be handled quite delicately. Because we're, we're told uh, we need to have that same kind of fear. Uh, when we read further in Hebrews in chapter 12 and verse 28, 
Uh, if you want to turn there, we can go there quickly and read this. Uh, Hebrews 12, and verse 28 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful by it. May we serve God acceptably with reverence. And here it's added reverence and awe. Reverence and awe. You see, except for that Christ's occasions of need far exceeded the severity of our own, it would appear that our fears are then quite similar to those of Jesus when he came in the flesh. Um, and in the same way, we offer up prayers and we offer up supplications and appeals to God in our time of need. At least I, I sincerely hope we are, brethren. But if being heard by God is what we're after, then we need to know, as Jesus Christ learned, these scriptures are there for us to learn, and we have Jesus' example here. It's going to be because of our godly fear. And it has nothing to do with status or the big corporate church that you might belong to. It's about godly fear. So with that, we're going to shift gears just a touch. And we'll try to round this message out today somehow. And have a, a look at an example. I said we'd do this at the beginning. An example of Jesus being tempted in terms of obedience. Okay, uh, because I think that might, <clears throat> that might be something that's somewhat hard for some folks to swallow. That uh, Jesus Christ was tempted in terms of obedience. Um, but we're going to look at an example of that. And we'll look at the pressure that it clearly put on him. Let's look at one of the most expressive emotions uh, that Jesus Christ uh, uh, that Jesus Christ uh, was an example of during his time on earth. And we'll find that recorded in the book of John. And it's John 11 and verse 35, and that's the shortest verse of the Bible. Uh, the ever popular, Jesus wept. But what brought that around? What brought Jesus to that point? Of weeping, and there's a number of spots in the Bible where uh, we can read that Jesus did, in fact, uh, uh, weep. But this was a particular example that John wrote in some detail, and it was uh, written out in special detail, I think, for a reason. Um, so, in order to understand what brought Jesus uh, to tears in this instance, we want to develop an understanding of the events that led up to this. And, uh, of course, this is the period of time when Lazarus was sick and did, in fact, die. Now, regarding this, there are two common ideas that are usually presented regarding the emotions of Jesus Christ in John 11. And one is that he was angered due to the disbelief of those around him. Um, and another is that he was caught up in the emotion of the moment and was sympathetic to the... Uh, a feeling of loss of a fellow loved one with, with everyone around. But I think we'll find that the context of the story, brethren, reveals a far more deeply felt and, and traumatic instance in Jesus Christ's life that actually brought about a particular uh, confrontation within him. So we're told that Lazarus of Bethany uh, is, is sick and that he's the brother of Mary. And this is in John 11. Uh, and in verse 2, we're reminded of Mary's faith and devotion and her love and gratitude for Jesus. And for she had been, as the scriptures say, as forgiven much. So well, let's turn over the quickly to John 11. We'll begin in verse 2. It says, Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. And it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. So in their belief that Jesus could help, uh, and in this case specifically, uh, he could help Lazarus uh, with his sickness and, and cure him, and heal him, uh, the, the sister sent this message out to Jesus uh, regarding his condition. And the hope, of course, was to persuade Jesus to come to Lazarus' rescue. And the sisters re there remind him of this close relationship with their brother. And we find that in verse 3. It says, Lord, the one whom you love 
your friend, your brother, this person whom you, you care for so much, he's sick. And here's where things get kind of tough, because Jesus reveals the purpose of the illness uh, that had been brought upon Lazarus, and that it was for the glory of God, and, and that Jesus Christ himself would be glorified by this. So again, we find ourselves in one of those situations, or Mary found herself in this, this situation, you know, where it seems to be a dichotomy in terms. There's this horrible suffering on one hand, but it's about God's glory. And so we see that there's, there's some uh, inner turmoil. But Jesus remained in the place that he was for two more days, even upon hearing this. And this was to ensure that Lazarus had, in fact, died uh, before he arrived. So there's, there's a tough couple of days, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, but Jesus had purpose in ensuring there was no doubt about the death of Lazarus upon his arrival at Bethany. He, had to, he was making sure that he was no longer alive when he, when he got there, and he had reasons for this. See, Jesus invariably knew that he was executing the will of the Father by ensuring that Lazarus was dead. Meaning, the Father's perfect will is paramount to Jesus. And in the forefront of his mind, and this was also an occasion uh, wherein Jesus could get those whom he, he loved, these people that he was so close to, um, to believe in greater measure. We'll, we'll see the scripture that say that. You see, after Jesus confirmed that Lazarus had in fact died, he expressed the following in verses 14 and 15. So if you want to carry on here in John 11 and verse 14, it says, so when Jesus t then told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And then, then he makes a, a really uneasy statement, you know, if we're reading this with any emotion at all. He says, I'm glad for you that I wasn't there so that you may believe. But, let's go to him. You see, the execution of the Father's will is again emphasized in Jesus' own words that he was glad that he was not there to heal Lazarus. And we get the distinct uh, idea that he would have been very much tempted to do so had he, had he been there. So when he said this, he revealed his intentions. When he said, I'm glad I wasn't there, he revealed his intentions. And that the disciples as well as uh, uh, others would believe more greatly in Jesus and his identity as the Son of God and that he does in fact have power over life and death. And through these things, of course, he exposes the Father. And this is the single-minded approach uh, that Jesus incorporated to be successful. And this is how he was successful, as well as being an example to all of those who would follow him. So let's carry on. Let's drop down to verse 20 of John 11. It says, as soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Now, Martha's words in verse 21 expressed this profound disappointment she was feeling in Christ's failure to fulfill her need and Lazarus' need. They knew that Jesus could save him from sickness, right? But as verses 22 and verse 27 also uh, point out, her faith didn't fail. Her faith in him didn't fail, but she was still compelled to express this disappointment. 
Um, but we see in verse 22 that her faith didn't fail. She says, yet even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And in verse 27, yes, Lord, she told him, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who comes into the world. She was aware of who he was. She had faith in who he was. But she had this frustration and this sadness because of what she could see in front of her. She wasn't yet in view of the larger picture that Christ was uh, trying to show. So in that, Jesus was aware that this was about her understanding. So he used the opportunity here to enhance that understanding. Uh, and that is that the resurrection to life is so strongly tied to him that he himself is the resurrection and the life. So, while Jesus appears to be concerned with comforting her, he does, however, seem to be more concerned with bringing the greater context to victory over death to the forefront. And this is where the confrontation lies. Let's go to John 11 and verse 32. Verse 32 says, Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So here we see an emotionally drained Mary. She collapses at his feet. She sees the one that she had counted on the most. She had relied on the most, but in her eyes, he was there too late. And Jesus undoubtedly felt this. I don't think that he was hard in this aspect. He, he undoubtedly felt this. And in verse 33, it says, Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. This troubled him. And there are numerous interpretations of the reason behind Jesus' inner emotional response to what he was confronted with here, such as that he had this inner indignation uh, uh, translated here as groaned in the spirit, uh, in the, uh, expressed in this verse, and that was at the evil of death that had afflicted those who were around him. And I just say that that, that would be highly unlikely it's not an adequate answer because it was very unlikely that Jesus was not already acquainted with suffering and death. And we know that to be the case. You see, John wrote here that Jesus was troubled. That he was troubled, suggesting he was, for that moment, not certain. Not certain as to what it was that he had encountered. See, the death of Lazarus was allowed for the very purpose of bolstering their faith. But it was emotionally taxing on his loved ones. That is, Lazarus' loved, loved ones, which included Jesus Christ. This was incredibly emotionally heavy and sad and dark. And it's sometimes taught that Jesus was simply moved with compassion. And he was just joining in with everyone else's emotions over the death of this mutual friend and brother. And while that might sound appealing, folks, the context, if we, ha if we consider the actual context here, that starts to fall apart very quickly in terms of what was actually troubling Jesus Christ. See, John writes of Jesus being kind of unmoved by the actual death of Lazarus, even though he had love for him and for his family. But this uh, apparently unmoved Jesus, confident in his father's will, is suddenly confronted with a grief that could have been avoided had he not delayed. This is something that could have been prevented. But he delayed for the purpose of fulfilling and executing his father's will. And this was one of those moments where our will and God's will sometimes don't meet in the middle. And 
It's hard on us. And clearly it was hard on Jesus Christ. Brought him to tears. You see, he had suddenly come to terms with how the will of God on this occasion had conflicted and opposed the deep need that humans have. And it was being shared, just to make it that much tougher, it was being shared by those who were closest to him. This was very personal to him. So what we see expressed here is Jesus being caught in the inner conflict of doing his Father's will and the needs of finite human beings. This sudden realization evoked a strong emotional response and it troubled him deeply. And humans were built with this release valve that manifests itself in, in, uh, in crying and weeping. Therefore, Jesus wept. Because I think this, this was a pressure moment. And it needed a release valve. And he utilized it. You see, he would have loved to have healed Lazarus, I'm sure. We said that already. I'm sure that he would have loved to have healed Lazarus, but to do so would have meant more than the death of just Lazarus. And this is heavy stuff. See, had he not delayed, Jesus knew that his proclivity to heal was strong. And to intervene would have been incomplete and total unacceptable opposition to his father's will and his plan. But the pressure of being human with divine purpose overcame even his personal and mental capacity. Uh, and it required this release. And this is why he wept. So when we see the full context, we see how Jesus did in fact suffer occasions and situations that are no doubt familiar to us. And accepting and obeying God's directives can be an emotional and unpleasant prospect for us at times. But thankfully, we have a high priest that has experienced that kind of pressure too. See, Jesus Christ is our high priest. He is a learned high priest. And he is qualified to be. And that is because of how he learned and what he learned. His obedience as a human was tested. And he learned. And likewise, we have ours tested. And God willing, we learn from Jesus Christ's example. So let's go to a concluding scripture. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 and verse 18. This will be the upbeat scripture for the uh, end of the message here today. It says, therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted he is able to aid those who are tempted. You see, we all face tragedy. We all face illness and death. And Jesus is indeed aware of the acuteness of loss and how that might lead to the temptation for some to fall away. And the same would likely apply to betrayal and all other forms of temptation that uh, we might encounter. But doing our best, brethren, to comprehend the meaning of Jesus' earthly walk correctly will help us understand how he, as high priest, relates to us. Human beings, finite human beings, who in their development as Christians cannot always fully comprehend God's will at all times. But thank God we have a learned high priest to advocate on our behalf. So brethren, as you see, I'm out of pages, and that means I'm out of time. So I say thank you again for joining us. Happy Sabbath, and we'll see you again next time on Shepherd's Voice magazine.